Hey everybody, welcome back to Star Trek Nitpickers. Lieutenant William here. I hope you are doing excellently. So today we're talking about the making of The Measure of a Man, one of the most famous episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. First, let me thank you for subscribing. It's a free and easy way for you to help us make more videos. You can also donate to help us with the buy me a coffee link in the description box. Okay, so there is so much to say about this episode from a behind the scenes point of view. It's kind of crazy. The title comes from a quote from Plato, the measure of a man is what he does with power. One famous thing about this episode is it was the first episode written by Melinda Snodgrass back before she was even really a professional writer. So Melinda Snodgrass was a lawyer in New Mexico and it was her friend Victor Milan who suggested that she try to become a writer after they both attended a barbecue at Fred Saberhagen's house. Saberhagen was a well-known science fiction writer and at his barbecue... Snodgrass got to hear writers read and talk about writing, and she thought they were the most interesting people in the world, and felt she'd rather hang out with them than the lawyers she worked with who were more interested in talking about billable hours when they were hanging out than lofty moral issues addressed by the law. It was actually Yoda saying, Try not. Do. Or do not. There is no try that convinced Snodgrass to quit her job as a lawyer. She went to see Empire with Victor Milan, and that cinched it. It also puts a star date on our little story here, 1980. Snodgrass was a fan of Star Trek the original series, and so her friend Victor Milan proposed that she write a novel about Star Trek. She loved the idea, and despite not being on the list of approved authors, her outline was purchased by David G. Hartwell. Snodgrass and Milan discussed ideas, and she decided that she would go with a softer, more friendly story along the lines of the episodes The Trouble with Tribbles or The City on the Edge of Forever. Snodgrass wanted Uhura to be central to the book, partially in an attempt to market the book as the character hadn't been prominently featured in other Star Trek stories. The book was called The Tears of the Singers, and it was the only Star Trek novel written by Snodgrass, who remembers that Hartwell gave her the advice to use the book to launch her writing career, but to never write another one. It was in the hands of the Klingons that the novel attained its full stature. I couldn't disagree more. Now, here's where things get a bit more interesting. She ended up becoming friends, good friends, with George R.R. R. Martin. Yeah, the guy who created Game of Thrones when he moved to New Mexico. And then he ended up moving to Hollywood after that and eventually calling her and telling her she could make it in Hollywood as a writer, in his opinion. He told her if she wrote a spec script, he would show it to his agent. Now, a spec script never gets bought, he told her, but it's a good way to get your foot in the door. So she said she'd do it, and she was sitting around later watching The Next Generation, and she realized there was a connection to the Dred Scott decision, which is when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that enslaved human beings are the property of slave masters back in 1857. And I thought, well, data's a toaster. So, you know, how is he any different than the computer on the ship? And that gave me the idea for the measure of a man. So she thought this was such a good idea that she actually called George R.R. R. Martin and asked him if it was too good an idea to use for her spec script, because spec scripts very rarely get made into actual shows, he'd explained to her. They're really just a way to get your foot in the door, he'd said. And George said to me, never hoard your silver bullet, meaning lead with the very best thing you can do. So she started working on this script. Then it was really thanks to another writer friend of hers, a retired naval aviator, who told her that on a ship at sea, when there's a matter that needs to be resolved, but there's no judge or court around, the captain will always act as the defense, and the first officer will always prosecute. Snodgrass was looking for some way to make her story work better, and she immediately realized this would give her a perfect way to pit two regular characters against each other and create some drama. Of course, many fans know Gene Roddenberry originally had a decree that TNG's main characters could not fight amongst themselves, and Snodgrass saw that as sort of boring and thought this naval law plot device was so logical that even Gene Roddenberry himself would have to accept it. So she wrote the spec script thinking it didn't stand a chance of getting sold 
And then, to her surprise, the folks at TNG bought the script, and following the success of The Measure of a Man, she joined the writing team. Now, let's take a look at an interesting side of the story. Let's stop looking at it from the writer's point of view and look at it more from the producer's point of view. Here's the thing. The Measure of a Man almost certainly never would have been filmed if it wasn't for the writer's strike in 1988. This was the longest writer's strike in history, and it wasn't just about money. Writers were striking for more creative control, among other things. They wanted some say in the casting process and in choosing directors. So, after the strike, a long time had gone by without the hired writers producing scripts, and that's why they were taking a long, hard look at the spec scripts that they would have otherwise just simply passed over. And that is why we got Measure of a Man. Not only was it a good story, but it was also free of scenes requiring expensive special effects. It was basically what they call a bottle episode, though those are really episodes that take place entirely on the ship. The idea is the episode is like a ship in a bottle, because they don't have to go down to a planet to tell the story. Of course, in The Measure of a Man, they do go on to a space station. What is it? It is... Here's a quote from Melinda Snodgrass about Gene Roddenberry's initial reaction to the script for The Measure of a Man. As to the issue of law in Gene's vision, he nearly killed The Measure of a Man because, according to Gene, there were no lawyers in the 24th century, because if people had criminal intentions, they, quote, had their minds made right, end quote. I found that chilling. I also pointed out that you have contracts that have to be negotiated, and conflicts of law between different legal systems, and divorces, etc., etc. There was no way there would be no lawyers in the future. I recognize this court system as the one that agreed with that line from Shakespeare. Kill all the lawyers, which was done. So Roddenberry ended up almost shooting the whole story down, saying there are no lawyers in the 24th century, but Snodgrass used some fancy fast-talking legalese and he gave in. Now, you may remember Picard and Q talking about how Shakespeare's line, kill all the lawyers, was taken seriously around the time of the Third World War, and it seems Roddenberry was serious about this. But you have to realize this is a bit of a retcon, because we definitely had lawyers on Star Trek, the original series. Well, you've heard about that. I'm a lawyer in the judge advocate's office, remember? In fact, the episode that prominently features them, Court Martial, is the 14th episode of the first season, and the character, Ariel Shaw, is basically a prototype for Philippa Louvois the JAG lawyer who becomes the de facto judge in The Measure of a Man. Both characters have a romantic history with the captain of the Enterprise, but both were also ultimately involved in court-martial proceedings for the captain. I also just have to point out that Melinda Snodgrass also wrote under the name Philippa Bornikova. Here's one more quote from Snodgrass about the story. Everyone seems to view it as a data script, but it's really a Picard script. Data is the catalyst, but the stress is all on Picard. And that's from the Captain's Logs, the unauthorized Complete Trek Voyages. Here's something interesting about the production side of the episode. The courtroom set was a redress of the Battle Bridge set. The set featured a map of the galaxy previously seen in the episode Conspiracy, and a chart showing the current location of 24 starships. The model of Starbase 173 was a reuse of a model best known as Space Lab Regula 1 from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Please, this is Reliant calling Regula 1. This episode has a lot of cool little connections to other episodes from both TOS and TNG. For instance, the Daystrom Institute, first mentioned here, was homage to the character of Richard Daystrom from the TOS episode, The Ultimate Computer. The episode also connects to the first Borg storyline. Admiral Nakamura tells Picard that Starbase 173 has been established in response to disturbances along the Federation Romulan neutral zone, 
which were first referenced in the episode The Neutral Zone. These disturbances will later be revealed to be early attacks by the Borg. So this episode that focuses on whether or not Data, a robot, has sentience, very subtly connects to the first ongoing story that introduces the Borg, a bunch of robots that we just can't quite see as sentient. Data's rights as a sentient being would again be challenged a season later in The Offspring, an episode Snodgrass was asked to rewrite, though she didn't write the first draft. It wasn't her idea, that story, but she did end up putting her stamp on it. There, the issue was whether Data could assert parental rights over his quote-unquote daughter, Lol. They're living, sentient beings. Their rights and privileges in our society have been defined. I help define them. In both episodes, Picard acts as Data's advocate. So Snodgrass really helped to get Data's ongoing story arc going in a great direction with the creation of the character Bruce Maddox, who, by the way, was played by Brian Brophy, who also was in the show Max Headroom, which of course starred Matt Frewer, ladies and gentlemen, who also famously guested on TNG. I will talk to Blank Hey! Ray. Talk to him. You should slam him back on the files. Traker. The Bruce Maddox character famously returned in Star Trek Picard, played by a different actor. But do you remember the other Next Gen episode he's mentioned in? That's right, it's Data's Day. That episode is framed with Data narrating a letter he's writing to Maddox about a day in his life so that Maddox can better understand him. The letter has been requested by Maddox, and it allows for a great low-stakes episode. Record entry for transmission to Commander Bruce Maddox, Cybernetics Division, Daystrom Institute. Data would refer back to his trial in his decision to champion the exocomps in Season 6's The Quality of Life. He explains to Picard that while he had Picard to defend him, the exocomps had no one to defend their rights. Now, of course, this is Star Trek Nitpickers, and we've got to go ahead and nitpick a little bit here. This episode contradicts a statement made by Dr. Pulaski in Where Silence Has Lease. In that episode, she states that Data is listed as alive. Forgive me again. Your service record says that you are alive. I must accept that. Maybe it's a good thing Melinda Snodgrass never saw that scene. Going down the nitpicking road, though, it does seem very odd that Data's personhood wasn't established as soon as he was admitted into Starfleet. Snodgrass, or Snod, as George R.R. R. Martin called her, asked, how is Data any different from the computer on the ship? Well, I think the first answer to that question is simply that he went through the Academy. I can't see how they could treat him like property after he joined Starfleet because of the precedent it would set. I think a lot of people from various alien races would have a lot to say about the idea that someone who'd gone through the Academy and joined the ranks of Starfleet could then be told they were just a piece of property that had no rights. I don't think the top brass at Starfleet could really be as blind to that as this episode makes them out to be. But that's just me. I mean, I can just imagine some guy whose body is 75% mechanical replacements and even his brain is one-third run by nanites or something saying, what's next? Are they gonna say I'm property and I gotta report to Dr. Frankenstein too? But Snodgrass saw this connection between the Dred Scott decision and Data. She started to wonder if he was really seen as more than property by the heads of Starfleet or not. And this is how we got this great episode. Uh, Captain, Commander Maddox is here to work on your android. It's more to this than just the cards, Data. Of course. The bets will indicate the relative strength of each hand. Time to pluck a pigeon, huh? One more little nitpick, I don't see how Data could read everything there is to read on poker, but not read a chapter on bluffing. That's about as crazy as a bureaucracy without lawyers. Speaking of that whole idea, I think it worked better in Back to the Future Part 2, personally. Within two hours, the justice system works swiftly in the future now that they've abolished all lawyers. I had read and absorbed every treatise and textbook on the subject and found myself well prepared for the experience. We've all been dancing around the basic issue. Does Data have a soul? 
Does data have a soul is the interesting question this episode is really asking, but the really interesting thing is that the officers of the Enterprise have already decided that he does, and nothing is going to change their minds. Now, of course, Data is a fictional character, and a very beloved one. It always seemed to me that the writers had collectively decided that, yes, of course, Data is alive, and he has a soul. I mean, Dr. Pulaski even says so. But in real life, we may very well have AI robots that act much like Data, but do not have souls and are not alive. And I'm a bit concerned that people are already having trouble knowing the difference. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. Emily Dickinson put it that way. Is it just words to you? What do you fathom the meaning? Why do I know about Emily Dickinson if I was born today? Getting back to Snodgrass, she originally wanted to start the episode with Data trying and failing to go swimming. The idea was he'd read every book there was on swimming, but then he sank like a stone because he weighs lots more than humans, and he can't understand why he failed. Snodgrass failed to get this scene in the final script because she was told Brent Spiner's makeup would come off in the water, and also, they almost never shot on location. Can he breathe underwater? Data doesn't breathe. There's something wrong, Doctor. Well, you're breathing. Yes. You decided to go swimming. <laughs> and when you jumped out of the boat, you sank straight to the bottom. I did not have enough buoyancy to get back to the surface. In the event of a water landing, I have been designed to serve as a flotation device. It took almost two weeks to get the water out of your servos. Because these limitations were imposed upon her, she created what would become a staple of the show, the poker game. She decided to have Data fail at poker instead of swimming. So this episode features the first appearance of the officer's regular poker game, with Data, Riker, LaForge, Dr. Pulaski, and O'Brien at the table for the very first game. It is also the first time Data has ever played the game. I bet five. So another thing that helped this episode in a big way, in my opinion, is the fact that as Snodgrass was working on the second draft of the script, she was told that they just realized in order to fulfill their contractual obligation to Whoopi Goldberg, Guinan would have to be written into the episode. They had a contract that guaranteed her a certain number of episodes, and they sort of suddenly realized they needed one more. Now, some critics have argued that this scene makes the whole episode heavy-handed, but I disagree. I think it works perfectly to help both Picard and the audience see the broader implications of the story and its moral. It's too bad Star Trek Picard didn't really address the moral question raised here when it showed us a world of humans that not only use androids to do dangerous jobs, but also talk down to them. Last time I checked, Melinda Snodgrass still hadn't been paid the money writers are supposed to be paid when a character they created is used on screen, as Bruce Maddox was in Star Trek Picard, which she was not a huge fan of. So, The Measure of a Man has parallels to modern times with people like the Google AI whistleblower Blake Lemoyne saying AI is already conscious and we're exploiting it and we need to establish what its rights are. Then there are also parallels to research into autism and other so-called disorders. I encourage you to watch this video that talks about how there are scientists who seem to want to sell various treatments to help autistic people make morally acceptable decisions when the research shows that they are already more likely to do that than so-called normal people in the first place. As great an episode as Measure of a Man is, I do have to wonder if the pendulum will swing too far. In Saudi Arabia, for instance, we have the story of Sophie, the AI robot, that has been granted citizenship, even though basic human rights are ignored there every day. The truth is, Data is a fictional character, and we don't have anything that comes close to him in real life. So, we have to keep that in mind, as this actually becomes more of a real issue. 
The Measure of a Man is an amazing episode that came together in some sort of a beautiful kismet, with everything just falling into place. For the second season, it's easily one of the best episodes in my opinion. Let me know what you think, though, in the comments below, and please do remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, like, share, and donate with the PayPal link on our channel homepage or the Buy Me a Coffee link in the description box. Thanks, everyone. Live long and prosper, and kapla!